Good day, fellow investors. We continue with our summaries chapter by chapter by the margin of safety and we are at chapter 6, the core of the book, the importance of the margin of safety, value investing. And it is clear that value investing shines in a declining market and therefore think it's extremely important and valuable. Let's start. As said, chapter six, the importance of a margin of safety, the core investment principle of value investing. And when it comes to value investing, what is value investing? It is the discipline of buying securities at a significant discount from their current underlying values and holding them until more of their value is realized. The element of a bargain is key to the process. In the language of value investors, this is referred as to buying $1 for 50 cents or less. That is the core of value investing. Plus, there are elements of value investing. You have to make a conservative analysis. What does it mean, conservative analysis? We just discussed Google and your financial goals, how that fits. But if I listen to analysts, Google will give me 19% return. If I'm more conservative, then I am down to 10%. Still good, maybe a value investment. Further, on the elements of value investing, you need discipline and patience to buy only at a significant discount. And then it all comes to discipline and patience. And this is so important that I want to read. The number of available bargains varies and the gap between the price and the value of any given security can be very narrow or extremely wide. Sometimes a value investor will review in that a great many potential investments without finding a single one that is sufficiently attractive. Such persistence is necessary, however, since value is often well hidden. The disciplined pursuit of bargains makes value investing very much a risk-averse approach. The greatest challenge for value investors is maintaining the required discipline. Being a value investor usually means standing apart from the crowd, challenging conventional wisdom and opposing the prevailing investment winds. It can be a very lonely undertaking. A value investor may experience poor, even horrendous performance compared with that of other investors or the market as a whole during prolonged periods of market overvaluation. Yet over the long term, the value approach works so successfully that few, if any, advocates of the philosophy ever abandon it. And especially value investing shines in a declining market, but you have to have the discipline. And the key with the discipline is to wait for the right pitch. And when it comes to waiting for the right pitch, we all know Warren Buffett's baseball analogy. You can pause this video and uh, read this. But the summary is that you invest only when the right pitch is in your sweet spot. You don't hit at other things. And you avoid also some sectors. For example, even Klarman says that banks, finance, insurance are very hard to invest and those are usually that cheap. And we made this video discussing those two months ago because I am not good enough to know what's going on. Just look at what's going with Credit Suisse, etc. So simply avoid and you wait for your comfort zone, for your circle of competence, for your sweet spot. Then another thing that value investing, especially Klarman, is not at with is that most institutions and everyone have to be invested at all times, fully invested. This depends, of course, on your strategy. But if you don't find things that are at your sweet spot, you might also sit and wait patiently with discipline for those sweet spots. So for a value investor, a pitch must not only be in the strike zone, it must be in his sweet spot. Results will be best when the investor is not pressured to invest prematurely. There may be times when the investor does not lift the bet from his shoulder. The cheapest security in an overvalued market may still be overvalued. You don't want to settle for an investment offering a safe 10% return if you thought it very likely that another offering an equal safe 15% would soon materialize. This is extremely hard to understand, but 
investments must be purchased at a discount from underlying work. And how to do that? You continually compare potential new investments with their current holdings in order to ensure that they own only the most undervalued opportunities available. Investors should never be afraid to re-examine current holdings as new opportunities appear, even if that means realizing losses on the sale of current holdings. In other words, no investment should be considered sacred when a better one comes along. And this is extremely important to understand. If you invest at 100, it goes to 70, but some other investment now is at 50 and it's much better than one at the 70, let's say, you sell the 70 and a loss to buy that one at the 50. And uh, this is something that explains no emotional attachment to your investments, just risk and reward and doing what is best at the moment now. This is what Klarman does. This is different than from what Buffett does, Klarman sits in cash, waits, waits and waits for the sweet spot, even more than Buffett. Buffett owns businesses and then reinvests the capital. Klarman is more of a trader, let's say, based on a value investment core psychology. And then as value investment comes, there will be many opportunities in panicky markets and we have to have the patience to check and look for the best. In exuberant markets, of course, there will be no opportunities and we have to have the patience to do nothing. The most important message is don't swing at bad pitches. What certainly helps with investing is knowing how to value a business and then you also know whether there is a margin of safety and whether it is a good buy. Now, when it comes to valuation, Klarman immediately says, it depends on the future. You cannot be certain about it because you never know what will happen in the future. Interest rates can go up and down. We can have deflation. We can have business cycles, whatever. So what is an investor supposed to do? Well, you say you buy value, but then Klarman also says value can also decline. We'll discuss that in a moment. His suggestion is to always do a conservative analysis and ask yourself, am I still good in a worst case investment scenario? If you are good in a worst case scenario, then the investment gives you low risk and high reward in the best case scenario. If there is more uncertainty, demand a higher discount in case of asset value deflation. Finally, the prospect of asset deflation places a heightened importance on the time frame of investments and on the presence of a catalyst for the realization of the underlying value. Again, something extremely different than Warren Buffett here. Warren Buffett says invest for the long term, hold, buy and hold, long term, then he does differently because we discussed that he usually sells nine out of his 10 positions. And that also is the same what Klarman says. Holding a stock for the longer term increases the risk of holding it. So you buy something, you check how it works. If it doesn't work, then it is more likely that it will go badly in relation to your expectations. So again, you see a lot of companies that Warren Buffett buys Verizon and then six months later he sells, he dumps 5 billion of that. That is because they both know that holding something just for holding it increases the risks. One out of 10 and then the selected one out of 1000 is what Buffett holds for the long term. Preferably his investment horizon is forever, but that is such rare that you have to always keep in mind and be ready to sell if it didn't happen if it takes too long and then you go next, you go for better as we discussed. So yes, long-term investing, if you can find that great business, but selling what doesn't work for better until you find that one great investment. That would be the combination and that would be something that even Warren is doing and even Seth Klarman. Part three, of course, when you value and everything, you need to focus on a margin of safety. Because as we discussed, value fluctuates too. $1 of value that you think it's value can be 75 cents 
because of interest rates going up or if interest rates go down can be 1.25 and you always have to discount the above value the larger the discount you can get the better margin of safety and the better your investment so if you find value of one if the price is half a dollar 50 cents for one dollar then your margin of safety is better because investing is as much as an art as a science investor need a margin of safety the more margin of safety you get the less it is an art and the more it is numerical and then a margin of safety is achieved when securities are purchased at prices sufficiently below underlying value to allow for human error bad luck or extreme volatility in a complex unpredictable and rapidly changing world this really summarizes it all when it comes to value investing and the margin of safety further the margin of safety is always dependent on the price paid for any security it will be large at one price small at some higher price non-existent at some still higher price so it always depends on the price paid this is a great picture that if you want to invest with a margin of safety you go over that bridge at a low pay if you pay too much it is a big risk that the bridge will collapse and you will not see your money this is from the super investors of graham and doddsville a 1984 warren buffett article you can check the video i did on it a year ago it's very much in line and also mentioned here in seth Klarman's book now what kind of margin of safety to look for well i always say see how the risk and rewards fits you and that is also what Klarman says how much bad luck are you willing and able to tolerate so it really depends on you how much volatility in business values can you absorb what is your tolerance for error and it comes down to how much you can afford to lose if you're a panicky person you can't afford then you invest with a high margin of safety but most investors don't look at these things institutions retail investors just follow trends and fads and as Seth Klarman says they invest with the margin of peril and not with the margin of safety further on the margin of safety he discusses how Buffett sees it in intangible assets but Klarman prefers tangible assets because intangible assets can be lost and also tangible assets can be valued more precisely more margin of safety and also tangible assets like real estate can have alternative uses real estate can be sold someone else can use it to do something else unlike say intangible assets that might lose their power on customer preferences of course warren buffett here looks at cash not so, so much brand value but if the brand is valuable then it produces a lot of cash but the core of everything is buying at a significant discount to underlying business value giving preference to tangible assets over intangibles and then replacing current holdings as better bargains come along by selling when the market price of any investment comes to reflect its underlying value and by holding cash if necessary until other attractive investment opportunities become available now always ask yourself why is something a bargain and how to work around the margin of safety look for catalysts that might unlock a value i'm recently looking at Miller and every successful investor at the end comes to the same philosophy as Miller says okay this is a great analysis but what will push this stock up in the next 12 months 18 months that is also what Seth Klarman here discusses look for the catalyst that might unlock the value something very important to think over time there are plenty of bargains out there asset values this or that but what will push the stock higher sounds simple but extremely difficult to apply at least in my experience good management with a stake in the business always helps to avoid losses then again Klarman goes again 
against Munger and Buffett, he says that diversify your holdings and hedge when appropriate because he says that we will make errors for sure and we will make less if we are diversified. So then again, counter to what Warren Buffett says and investments. Now, you can pause the video here. You can read some great examples of what an investment is with the margin of safety. This is one. Pause it here. Here is another one for Texaco. Pause it. And here is the second part from Texaco. Now, when it comes to the importance of the margin of safety, it allows for mistakes. You win or you don't lose much if you are wrong. The value, as we said, is not stable. It all depends on how much risk you can take. You have to prefer tangible assets. It all depends on price. And then buy and sell to manage the risk and reward in your portfolio. This would be the summary of the importance of the margin of safety. Value investing shines in a declining market. And this might be the most important sentence for you as an investor that you hear for the next 10, 20 years. Because when the overall market is strong, the rising tide lifts most ships. Profitable investments are easy to come by. Mistakes are not costly and high risks seem to pay off, making them seem reasonable in retrospect. As the saying goes, you can't tell who's swimming naked till the tide goes out. That is what we have been enjoying over the last 10 years. A bull market, the greatest bull market in history. But a downturn is the true test of a real investment strategy. And you have to avoid the torpedo stocks as Seth Klarman calls them, the growth stocks. And consequently, the securities owned by value investors are not buoyed by such high expectations. To the contrary, they are usually unheralded or just simply ignored till the fundamentals push them higher. And then when it comes to buying something, he says that it's best when the P ratio is so low, the expectations so bad already, so cheap, and therefore little room to go lower. And here Seth Klarman didn't have the data, but from 1969 to 1982, the market actually went nowhere. So the market, the Dow, the S&P went nowhere, but the lowest 20th percentile of PE ratios and price to book ratios actually did 10x in this period. That is remarkable. That is what makes the difference between real investing and everything else. And that is also the answer I have when someone asks me about index funds. Yes, you have enjoyed the best bull market in history for the last 40 years. It will continue. I don't know. I hope it for you. But if not, if you want more, if you want less risk and higher reward, then value investing is the way to go. The next part of this chapter is that the efficient market hypothesis doesn't work. And I completely agree with it. I've done my research on my PhD with that topic, and it's the biggest bollocks I ever heard. Because at the very core of its success of value investing is the recurrent mispricing of securities in the marketplace. There are several forms of the efficient market hypothesis that Past prices don't give useful info on the future. Wrong, because the price tells you what you will make from an investment. Also, the idea is that there is no advantage because the market discounts all public information. That's also wrong because the market discounts short-term public information. That's longer-term thinking. We might have benefits. Index fund investing, that random Stock picking is the best passive, no benefit by stock picking. So Klarman says that the efficient market theory in whatever form is totally wrong because small caps are unfollowed by analysts. Group things by investor leads to bubbles like the dot com bubble, etc. That loses people a lot of money. And then he summarizes that the elegance of the 
Efficient market theory is at odds with the reality of how the financial markets operate. And again, check the video on the super investors where Warren Buffett himself explains this. Why is the efficient market hypothesis totally wrong? Because stock prices are moved by short-term supply and demand. For example, Warner Bros. Discovery, a stock that we have included in our YouTube portfolio to learn about it, is down 50% because all the AT&T dividend holders dumped it because they received it as a dividend, sold it to get the cash. And that is why there was incredible short-term pressure. Plus, this is not a huge dividend stock, which means that institutional selling of a low price small capitalization spin-off or something that doesn't pay dividend can cause temporary supply demand imbalance resulting in a security becoming undervalued, which means that the market is not efficient, at least not always. However, unlike classic arbitrage, value investing is not risk-free, profits are neither instantaneous nor certain, therefore you need to have a margin of safety. And especially when it comes to value investing, you have to beware of value pretenders. Everything looks like value, but I have learned over time that 9 out of 10 times it is actually a value trap. And value investing is one of the most overused and inconsistently applied terms in the investment business. Even I have a value investment with Svenkalin channel. Of course, I did have my success there, but it is still questionable how big of a value investor I am and everyone that uses this title. Because any security is value in the eye of the buyer and is less value in the eye of the seller. The most conservative, actually, value investors are always criticized for their excessive caution prudence that proved well-founded, let's say, in the 1990s, 2007s, and whenever. Just to give you an example here, when there was the dot-com mania, Warren Buffett didn't invest there and Berkshire went down 37%, if not more, from March 99 to March 2000. In the same period, the Nasdaq went up 110%. So crazy performance from the Nasdaq compared to Buffett's terrible, terrible performance. Of course, that is exactly what Seth Klarman explained at the beginning with horrendous performance because other people are following manias that unfortunately for them crumble sooner or later. And this leads to the conclusion value investing is simple to understand but difficult to implement. Value investors are not super sophisticated analytical wizards who create and apply intricate computer models to find attractive opportunities or assess underlying value. The hard part is discipline, patience, and judgment. Investors need discipline to avoid the many unattractive pitches that are thrown, patience to wait for the right pitch, and judgment to know when it's time to swing. We will continue next week with the next chapter. Please check the playlist here. I hope you are enjoying this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.